case was Her Majesty the Queen versus Christopher James Clay and Jordan Kent Prentice. The accused were jointly charged at honor about the 17th day of May 1995 at the City of London did unlawfully traffic in a narcotic, namely cannabis sativa, contrary to Section 4, Subsection 1 of the Narcotic Control Act. How has this affected your future, all of this? Chris is facing three life sentences. Clearly, Parliament has an obligation to make sure that the law is sound before they expose this man, this man, to three life sentences. Chris Clay is the owner of the Hemp Nation retail store in London. Jordan Prentice is one of his employees. Nearly two years ago, they were arrested for selling a small cannabis plant to an undercover police officer and hit with a variety of charges. Clay has decided to use the case as an opportunity to challenge the country's cannabis laws. He's hired two Toronto lawyers, Paul Burstein and Osgood Hall law professor Alan Young, to handle his case. During the course of the trial, the defense is expected to call expert witnesses from across North America, including a Harvard psychiatrist and a senior scientist with the Addiction Research Foundation. Young says if his clients are convicted on the original charges, he will then launch a constitutional challenge, arguing that it is beyond the authority of Parliament to criminalize harmless conduct. How did we ever get involved in this? I mean, we've never touched that stuff. We don't smoke. We're, I mean, we're never interested. And here we are, at this stage in our lives, somehow semi-funding a constitutional challenge for marijuana. I just can't believe what happened. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what life is going to give you. <laughs> well, I tried smoking pot maybe twice when I was 16, and uh, I ended up drinking. I thought that must be safer because it was legal. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 21, going to Ryerson, that I first uh, you know, really got into it. And while I was studying there, that's when I started to uh, research the hemp and marijuana issue. So when I came back to London uh, for the summer, I had a booth at a flea market just distributing literature. And uh, it was just overwhelmingly popular. People were coming and they wanted information and books. Um, so after four weekends, I ended up getting a store. And then I got a youth venture loan from the government to uh, get some more inventory. We did pretty good for the first two years, although uh, I'd never had any business experience. So I had to learn a lot of things the hard way. We had some things made from hemp, hemp clothing and, and paper and whatnot. And we also had pipes and bongs and uh, grow guides and, and seeds, seeds to grow marijuana. We had the best deal in Canada. Uh, we would sell six seeds for $25 with a 100% germination guarantee, which just means, you know, they'll all pop, they'll all germinate and grow. I did that very openly, actually. No, uh, you know, the police never hassled me at all. I had a big sign in the window with all the strains listed. Yeah, I think he operated for four years without any problems until this undercover officer went in and bought this little seedling. And that's how the case started. Why, why did he sell these clones? He sold them because he wants people to grow their own pot so they don't have to become part of the black market and perpetuate all the evils that are associated with the black market. And he knew what he was doing. He knew he'd get caught. I mean, he wasn't doing this in a subterranean way like a drug trafficker trying to make a lot of money. And well, if I win, everybody wins. It's going to be legalized for industrial, recreational, and uh, medical purposes. Now, these are three very separate issues. Some people are only interested in one instead of all of them. Um, but unfortunately, these laws link them all together. So, you know, I'm kind of involved with all of them right now. I didn't realize that he was going to start selling these bongs and things like that because I definitely wouldn't have approved of that. However, he did it, and uh, my name's on the note, so I have no choice, but I have to continue to support him. I was selling pipes and bongs since I opened them. You were? Yeah. The first day I had pipes. <laughs> I thought it was just all, oh boy. <laughs> anyway, well, I didn't you have didn't many. Know? I didn't have many. Well, when you were selling those seeds, and uh, then the, seeds, when you yeah. got those plants down there, I almost hit the roof. <laughs> and the reason why you did it, I guess you wanted to get, you know, he wanted to get arrested, he wanted to get this thing in the courts and so on. But I never dreamed they'd seize the inventory. That's what really screwed well, me over. This made me very angry that you did that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a foolish thing to do. I don't know if... <laughs> Spontaneous. Spontaneous, yeah. Someone brought them in, and I decided, all right, now's the time. Would you do anything spontaneous like that again? Well, I don't know. We'll have to see how this turns out before I... <laughs> well, I'm not signing any votes for you again. That's it. <laughs> Live in 
the suburbs. It's a quiet house, and we had a police drug raid. They kicked the door in and, you know, trashed my room and guarded my mother for three hours so she wouldn't destroy evidence. And who would ever believe that I would be watched by a police officer <laughs> for three but, uh, hours in my own that home? That was probably the most disturbing thing to me because they were trying to stop Chris. They were trying to intimidate him. They didn't want this challenge to continue. Certainly there are other people in the country that are much more vocal mm -hmm. than Chris is, but the fact is Chris was uh, involved in a constitutional challenge, and there's no doubt in my mind that they want to put as much pressure on him as possible. And they thought, well, maybe if we invade his home that he'll realize that this whole thing is not worthwhile. I think it made all of us more angry mm -hmm. and probably made me more determined. I was very much an establishment type and uh, I didn't really challenge anything. I didn't want to rock the boat, but when it happens to you, when somebody comes in your house like that, mm -hmm. that is scary and it can happen in Canada. I mean, what a waste of money to pay a police officer three hours mm -hmm. uh, time to watch me. Someone robbed the bank in the Galleria Mall while they were raiding the store that day. When we got, the day that we got busted, the bank got robbed. There's a little bar just two doors down. One of the crackheads from there went to the Galleria Mall a block away, robbed the bank. We had the bank robber go, went next door, and bought rounds of beers for everybody in the uh, bar. And they blew all the money, got really wasted, left. And by the time the police got down there, he was gone and had spent all the money, so there was nothing they could do. And here we are getting busted, you know? Harass the uh, pot smokers, but leave all the drunks and uh, bank robbers and crack addicts alone. Because marijuana seeds are much more dangerous than an armed robber waving a gun in someone's face. That's the way it is in the world. So Chris can do life for selling marijuana seeds, and the armed robber gets away with armed robbery. It's a beautiful day out. A nice little hike in the woods. People get some blood running through the body. Especially if you live in the city, it's beautiful to grow because it gets you out to the country. When it comes to gardening, you should have one golden rule over every other rule. The only people that need to know about your garden are people that are going to help you with the garden. That people that need to know about the garden. Now, just doing this with plants in your back would be fun for me. <laughs> Realize this is life imprisonment in Canada. Cultivation carries trafficking by the criminal code, which uh, maximum penalty is life imprisonment. So right now, this is basically, I guess I'm committing a life, something that I should serve life in jail for. Here is a most tragic case. Yes, I remember. Just a young boy. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. Why did you do all this? Yeah, it was angry and I thought the law should change. So politicians wouldn't listen. What you have to understand in terms of Canada that our first drug laws were not directed at drugs per se. And what it was about was the smoking opium factories run by Chinese and the Chinese were resented for their cheap labor. They would work for 40 percent of what white trade unionists would work for and at the turn of the century the first drug legislation was introduced in the House, and it received absolutely, virtually no comment. And opium smoking was prohibited. And, and, and then things proceeded apace, really. Cocaine was criminalized in 1911, and uh, there was a uh, uh, flirtation with the prohibition of alcohol during 1918, 1919. This is very much sort of temperance ideology of the time. Um, marijuana was criminalized in 1923 with no debate. All that was said in the House of Commons was, there is a new drug in the schedule. I discovered a book by uh, Judge Emily Murphy. Uh, she was the first woman appointed to the bench in the British Empire. This book had been serialized in Maclean's. It argued that marijuana was a new menace, that if you smoke the dried leaves of the plant, uh, this produces insanity. And that's where, in fact, we got our first prohibition against marijuana from the writings of Emily Murphy in 19, 1923. So you introduce a law, presumably because there's a problem. There wasn't any problem. There weren't any convictions until 1937. And then from 1937 to 1961, you get about 10 to 12 convictions per year. And then in the mid-60s, um, 1,000 people in 1967 coming to court charged with marijuana possession. And the figures grew from there. With the hippie movement, 
middle class kids and upper middle class kids began dressing like lower class kids. And when they began to be subject to these punitive laws and broad powers of arrest, search, and seizure, and the violence associated with drug enforcement, then all of a sudden, we had to have a royal commission. God knows my kids can't be treated like the way we treat the Chinese or lower, lower class white heroin users. It was terrible to see your son in jail and going visiting him out at the detention center. I went And he's too. coming out there with all these uh, different people. And then Chris comes walking through in the prison garb and, uh, hi, Dad. <laughs> I couldn't believe I'd ever see my son <laughs> dressed up like that. My father had actually put up $5,000 cash to get me out of jail, so, you know, without him, I'd still be in there. <laughs> they have a camera on every cell. Like, you look up, and there's a camera staring in. So I was trying to get a little privacy, put some blankets up, and took my blankets away. And didn't give me any toilet paper. It was pretty miserable. They, they leave the lights on all night. I just had to sleep on a metal bed. <laughs> I never want to go back there again, but it wasn't... <clears throat> it wasn't the most fun place. I didn't like it. They were just so rude to you. And, well, I was the only female there that night. <laughs> I can't believe it in the whole city of London. That's what I didn't like. I thought there must be far worse people than I. <laughs> so it was a little eye opening. And I came back from jail. They took me there for the night and found my whole store was empty. So that was quite a shock. I sort of think it's heroic, and I sort of think he's totally mad. <laughs> who wants to get arrested and have a criminal record for their life? And... Oh, technically, I face maybe four or five life sentences now. I'm not even sure. Uh, it's hard to keep track of so many charges. I can't think about it. I, can't, I just cannot allow myself to think about that. I, I refuse to accept the worst possible verdict. So I don't even want to talk about that. You have to bring some hemp products mm. to court. Sure, well, that's no problem. A shirt. No, yeah, a shirt. Uh, I'm trying to think. You don't have any ties, do you? Yeah, we have a tie. That's... Wear one. Okay. Because I think that would be nice high drama. Um, I'll do take it, it off it. you. Yeah. And I'll and I'll hand it well, to well, the well, Wait, wait, wait. You're gonna take his shirt off? And <laughs> no, no. His his tie. His tie. <laughs> he said he has a tie. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes, that's right. They're the same species, cannabis sativa. Uh, and the differentiation is that marijuana produces uh, and has been selected to produce high levels of cannabinoids, specifically uh, the THC type, whereas uh, hemp is selected for fiber production and screened or selected for low THC uh, production levels. And because we know what it is about marijuana that makes it psychoactive, <coughs> it should be incumbent on Parliament to prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, that someone is selling something which can be psychoactive, not something that you just use to make shirts and rope and twine and things like that. It'll provide uh, a new crop, new source of income, and a crop that we can develop to finish product. So it, it has the beginning of a huge industry that we can be a part of the, the large global picture. You're afraid. That's better. That's more like it. I know you like that. Really you will. I'll just take a puff of it. It cuts across all socioeconomic groupings. It cuts across um, a range of values, attitudes, and beliefs. It's predominantly an activity of the young and unattached. When people get to their mid to late 20s, there's a phenomenon known kind of as maturing out or aging out. That's just kind of like a phase. Like back in the 60s, all the kids used to do it. Some of the, adult, uh, the adults still do it now, but most of them don't. My colleagues, certainly, who have concerns, as I do, about the law, absolutely do not 
believe that young people who use this drugs are criminals, nor should they be treated as criminals. We got pulled over one time, and I totally forgot I had anything on me, and had to go through just a little bit, and had to go through all fingerprinting and pictures and everything, and it ended up getting dismissed, and no, uh, nothing followed, like no criminal record or anything like that, but it was just a waste of time. No one, I think, could argue that hauling someone into court is, is a, an experience that makes a young person more integrated into society and, and more confident and, and gives them self-esteem. It's, it's meant to be an extremely negative and humiliating experience. I was a wreck. <laughs> I am the 1% the or less than 1% that smokes marijuana on a daily basis and have been doing so for over 25 years. During that time, I received a university degree, a postgraduate degree. I advanced from assistant management position to management position. I held down a teaching job and uh, received very good performance appraisals on the work I did for them. Uh, after 25 years of partaking of a substance that's supposed to destroy me, uh, my brain is not addled, my body's not decrepit. Well, we have to realize that in today's complex society, the use of uh, cannabis uh, can stretch across various levels of the social strata. So people are able to obtain it by a variety of means. If they happen to be independent wealthy or they happen to have a, a reliable income, then of course they can access uh, cannabis uh, by means of a more sophisticated um, business network. Hey, I'm gonna buck a big rush now. If I don't get to the bank in 10 minutes, I can't pay for their hotel room. So I gotta go. See you guys. This has been much more stressful on him than people realize. He's the type of person that keeps everything inside. No, I saw her. It's Chris Collins. Not too much can do. Um, no one opened the store today. I was wondering if you might be able to work today. The sale of marijuana is even more difficult to detect and halt than the traffic in drugs such as opium, morphine, and heroin. There's evidence that uh, it can, in fact, uh, lead to more hardcore drugs such as heroin and cocaine. There is no gateway theory. There is no evidence. There's no theoretical approach. There's nothing to say that the use of cannabis leads to the use of another drug. I don't touch anything else except a reefer, like a marijuana reefer. Like, that's it. Like, you can die off alcohol. I never touch that, like, crack, cocaine, anything like that. That's just no. hard drugs. Yeah, there's no reason for that. I don't think pot can wreck your life, really, but if you start doing shit like that, like that'll wreck your life, I think. I've, I'm still smoking marijuana, so you call it a stepping stone. Yeah, I stepped up, and I realized what was up there. I didn't like it, so I came back down. And... I'm just off to pick up some more witnesses. We have a good day tomorrow. Um, Eugene Ospitella from the Canadian Foundation for Drug Policy. Uh, Marie-Andre Bertrand, she's a criminologist from Montreal. And uh, Diane Riley, she's a sociologist from Toronto. So they're all coming in tonight. Mate. Mate! What do you want? Bring me some reefers. Addiction is one of the old myths which very few people uh, uh, believe in now. Of the psychoactive drugs that humans take, marijuana is the least likely to produce this kind of behavior. It has a very low likelihood of producing the kind of behavior that we refer to as dependence and addiction. Less than caffeine. Less than, certainly less than alcohol and nicotine. Cannabis or marijuana is related to just about any kind of street crime breaking into houses and uh, stealing goods that can be uh, traded on the street for cash. Uh, breaking into cars this, these days is quite popular, particularly with cell phones and laptops left carelessly on the seats of cars. You make something illegal, you create this false scarcity of the, of the product. That drives the price up. And if it's a drug like cocaine or heroin, very different from cannabis, where, where people can become uh, dependent much more easily, um, then... Uh, some of these people turn to crime in order to finance habits. Now that's not true with cannabis because the cost of cannabis is very low relative to even a drug like alcohol. You see much more crime in, or, or what should be uh, caught as crime in bars, say when people get rowdy, break glasses, fight and so on, 
uh, than you do around marijuana, which is uh, much more pleasant as a social behavior. You've never heard of anybody uh, getting mugged by somebody who was high on marijuana. That just, that just, that just doesn't happen. That's the whole point of the case. What do you do with this nice boy? Give him a conviction so he can't get a job? Put him in jail? It doesn't make any sense. You know, jails for people like Clifford Olson, son of Sam. Picture him in jail. He won't survive. What about Jordan Prentice? They'll make them into criminals, you know? Since August 18th, police have arrested a dozen people in western Ontario and have pulled up 23,000 pot plants in cornfields and bush lots. They say taking $7 million worth of marijuana off the street is worth the cost of an annual weed control program one of them calls crop busting. Two choppers in the air, supported by up to a dozen officers on the ground. It's a lot easier in 30 seconds to go ahead and say, look, we're going to get tough on drugs. That's a, that's a great sound bite. It doesn't work in its effect. I mean, the, the, the sound bite works. It makes you look great to the public. The fact is you can't get tough on drugs, and more police and more guns and more repression and more violations of individual liberties will not solve the problem, but it makes great political, it makes great media fodder. And that's one of the problems is that the, the, the media feeds on exciting drug busts. And criminals will take over, police say, if we don't act. Although, police say their eye in the sky won't make as big a dent in the marijuana business as the public's eyes, ears, and noses. That's much more exciting television than sitting and interviewing me. My main concern was raising money. Until uh, I was ar uh, arrested in December, we'd only raised about, I think it was maybe six or $7,000. And we were we knew we'd need at least uh, fifteen twenty thousand um, dollars, but after that arrest, money started pouring in. We were making more money in donations than we did in sales on certain days. You know it's a shame I have to get arrested to raise money, but it worked. Uh, we're up to about twenty four twenty five thousand dollars now, so I think we have enough to do it right. Uh, with Chris sitting behind the computer all day updating the website, like how that website that he put together is bar none probably one of the best on the uh, internet right now. People realized what exactly is going on and they donated all this money. It's kind of like a slideshow with pictures. Cannabis Attire, the old standby cordage driver, is staging a strong comeback. I should make clear that the great majority of users don't suffer any harm from it. But about 60% or more of regular heavy users have evidence of chronic inflammatory lung changes. Cannabis has some pulmonary hazard, uh, but I think the hazard is minor and it's nowhere near the pulmonary hazard of tobacco cigarettes. Cannabis smokers, whatever their level, inhale less smoke than tobacco cigarette smokers, and it's the dose that makes the poison, whether we're talking about smoke or whether we're talking about individual drugs. If you smoke cannabis in a water pipe so that there is some condensation of the, uh, of the tar in the water, then you cut down the irritant qualities of the smoke, and that probably would be a good uh, move for anybody who is using it to, to diminish the risk of, uh, of lung irritation. Now, the other, only other harm of cannabis proven is that for a brief period of time it makes you a little stupid and a little clumsy. Cannabis is an intoxicating substance. People get high and they're not at their best in terms of psychomotor function. Nobody should drive while stoned. However, there's not much evidence that cannabis importantly contributes to vehicular mayhem in the Western world. We got the pharmacologist doctor, John Morgan, and he'll be at the end of the day and leading up to him will be a couple of medical patients who suffer from various ailments and find that cannabis alleviates the pain. And then something odd will happen is the director of the Bureau of Drug Surveillance will come. He's under our subpoena. And the upshot of what he will talk about is that Health Canada has not done any studies, medical studies, since 1972, the Ladane Commission. And I, I just find that to be negligent and remiss, considering the commission said, hey, there's not really a problem here. You should change the law. If you're not going to change the law due to studies to show that there's a reason to retain the law. Your Honor, in this case, the state waives trial of the defendant, Ralph Wiley. 
It is convinced that he is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. If I tell you to try it, I'm confident it may not work for you, but it isn't going to hurt you. Well, it is clearly effective in two things for which it has now been approved for, for medical use. Uh, one is the nausea and vomiting that's induced by anti-cancer chemotherapy. Uh, the other use for which it's approved is to stimulate appetite uh, in patients with AIDS, with the wasting syndrome. For people who are taking it for relief of symptoms, they, they don't talk much about the high. It doesn't make me really high or stoned or anything like that. It just um, it helps my body to function more without shaking because I shake constantly. And when I smoke, I don't. I don't shake. I, I'm in more control of my body, more control of my mind. And even though they know it's not a cure, it does help. You know, it helps you to control your bowels and your bladder, and especially your bladder. Like, <laughs> that's, that's devastating. Depending on what pain I'm having at the time or how many, uh, they start to be more tolerable. And then I can actually get up and do something. Where is the evidence? If this is so, bring it to us. Sh show us as you would with any other drug uh, application. We receive in the Department of Health applications daily, dozens from pharmaceutical companies, from others, saying that this compound or this uh, uh, this. Uh, therapeutic intervention will cause this effect, so please license us to sell it legally. Um, and we'd be delighted to receive that kind of scientific information. We just have a small representative sample of individuals who have acquired a certain understanding, but then you could start calling the individual scientists who've done certain tests and, uh, and, and expand it into international level. That's why governments appoint royal commissions inquiry. Because mm -hmm. people like Chris, they can't raise money like that. Right. And the government did appoint a Royal Commission of Inquiry, but they didn't like the conclusion it reached. The Lodane Commission, I think, for the first time, and probably worldwide, was one of the first scien modern scientific reviews. And it, it, it debunked the mythology. Thousands of youngsters are being criminalized for nothing. Okay, we said that. Then we went into the cannabis thing, and already the political climate was that the liberals were going into election, <laughs> and they were not sure at all that they would win these elections. By the time we, uh, uh, do you see, we tabled the final report, the, 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 the House of Commons was in disarray, and um, not one question, we were thanked for our good services and sent uh, to uh, etc., etc. So here went four years of extreme solid work, according to international opinion, the most solid work that was done in the field. Four years for books. And afterwards also several times asked by journalists, what did I think about it? And all I could say is, well, there's just nothing you can do. Politics rule everything, and politics, unfortunately, are not uh, based on intellect, so. Everybody expected to be acted upon because there's a tradition of acting on Royal Commission reports that are well thought out and reasonable, and the government lost heart. They just didn't have the courage to do it. I think we could never persuade a government um, to take the political heat from the, the uninformed right um, that this would be legalizing drugs and you couldn't do this, that it would cost the government uh, a large number of seats. Uh, I think most people realized that it was logical to do it, but nobody was willing to take the political risk involved. It's not what it used to be. Uh, we were all working towards a common goal before. We were all building up this huge hemp nation so that we would have this great community place to raise awareness, uh, to help people stop getting busted. It's kind of a sinking ship right now, definitely. Uh, Chris has to work all kinds of long hours all by himself. He has to do everything because he can't afford to keep us all anymore. He can't pay us. I'd love to keep working for as free as much as I can for as long as I can. I have a house to pay for now. I can't have a house and do what I want at the same time. It sucks, it's a harsh reality, but what am I gonna do? Be happy and be homeless at the same time. We'll contradict each other, I think. How's it going, Joey? 
I'm all right. I'm getting depressed. <laughs> well, I was devastated because I live in a small town. So, you know, it was splashed all over the paper and, and um, my pot was gone. So well, I was afraid of what was going to happen with my health. So I had to deal with my health and what people th thought and how family and friends dealt with it. After about two and a half hours in the principal's office, I was taken down to the school board uh, where I met uh, with the head of personnel. Uh, and uh, after a half an hour meeting, he uh, dismissed me from the board. I was fired uh, because of the charges that were, that were laid the night before. I decided to put a constitutional challenge in. And um, when my lawyer told the court that, then uh, they dropped the charges right away. Well, not they, they mentioned it, but it took them forever to do it. <laughs> but um, did they give a reason why they dropped the charges? Supposedly compassionate reasons. But if they were so compassionate, why didn't they drop the charges when I? was in the hospital a month after they busted me and I was almost, I was, my family was told I wasn't going to live. Why didn't they drop the charges then? Why did they wait a year and a half? Initially, um, it was shattering. Um, I had to, in fact, be hospitalized. Uh, the one night I thought I was having a, a heart attack. I felt robbed of my health and my dignity and my property. And if they would have put me in jail, it wouldn't have hurt me as much as my health has since then. I don't think if we had tried, we could have designed a system that causes more harm than the present system we have for enforcing our drug laws. It causes more death, destruction, misery, dysfunction than almost any other system we can imagine. You've taken over the store, and we've reached off with Bong. It's kind of back to the way it used to be. Passing the torch, they call it. They made a big deal out of it. The trial went so good, I mean, I think something good has to happen. But uh, I don't know if it's hard to say. I'm very surprised if something doesn't happen. If nothing came of this, I think that a lot of people would be really upset, well, obviously. Uh, it would just suck if nothing happened. I think at the very least, it should be, it, it'll be decriminalized. Yeah, and Alan said, too, like, he would just be happy if he doesn't avoid the issue, even if he rules against us, if, you know, if he gives a nice ruling and a critique of what we can use in the appeal, for example. But uh, he's hoping that he just doesn't try and get out of it through some technicality. And I feel cheated that way, too. Even if I get off, I mean, I could have plea bargained months ago. I didn't want to. We want to get see this resolved somehow. <laughs> Find the defendant guilty, is charged. London bookstore owner Mark Emery was the first to light up in front of the courthouse following the ruling. Although he and about a dozen opponents of the marijuana laws were smoking openly, there was no sign of the police. In his 90-minute long ruling, McCart said the evidence convinced him that marijuana consumption was harmless, that it caused no serious physical or psychotic damage, and that it did not lead to use of harder drugs. But he also ruled that Parliament determines what is illegal and that the charges did not infringe on the defendant's right. Clay was found guilty of possession and trafficking, but was acquitted on a cultivation charge. He I mean, basically said I'm a criminal. Well, I'm certainly not a criminal, and I think most, uh, in the minds of most people, that's pretty obvious. So, um, and I'll prove that in the uh, Court of Appeal and ultimately at the Supreme Court. If I want to smoke pot once a month or whatever, I'm certainly not a criminal. I don't think. But you're going to have a criminal's record, aren't you? Sure. They offered me a deal today. Uh, basically, I'll have to forfeit the inventory they seized, which is quite substantial. Uh, but all the new charges from December, which I think there's five or six, uh, they'll just lump them all together with the uh, charges that I was convicted on today, and I'll get a $1,000 fine. You know, one-shot deal, everything else is forgotten. Uh, and they'll also cut Sarah loose, which is 
uh, wonderful. I didn't really want her to be dragged through this for another two years like Jordan was. I'm just tired of the whole thing, to tell you the truth. Uh, I understand why Chris has done it, but uh, it's been a drain on, on us. It's been a drain on him. It's been a drain on his health. Uh, I know he feels very, very strongly about it, and I'm sure he's going to carry it right through to the end. If every member of Parliament could hear the evidence that was presented at Chris's trial, then they would be educated and they'd realize that the law is really unjust. Oops. Cannabis is illegal in Canada, at least in part because we're signatory to a United Nations convention called the Single Convention on Narcotics. Nonsense. And this is one of the myths they tell you. Oh, international treaties? We are, we are required to have stupid drug laws that criminalize people and don't work. It's written right in the, you know, the single convention. I mean, I've read the drug treaties. The drug treaties don't require us to have anything like the new legislation or anything close. Notwithstanding everything that's happened, uh, broadly, broadly in this country, attitudes, at least to my eye, have not shifted sufficiently that we're going to move the yardsticks on something like the decriminalization of marijuana. I just don't think that, that social attitudes have, have, have made that shift. Maybe what shifted are the attitudes of the baby boomers. When I uh, uh, used to do television or radio shows 15 years ago and, and, and I talked about cannabis, um, the response was very negative from 80, 90 percent of the callers or, um, or from the host in, on occasion. But Today, um, it's very different. Uh, 80 or 90 percent of the people agree with what I'm saying. My view has become mainstream. That is, that uh, we should de decriminalize possession of cannabis. I am a fan of decriminalization. I started speaking about legalization 20 years ago, but here's what I want. I want decriminalization to occur immediately. Decriminalization which says the possession uh, and the cultivation of small amounts of cannabis cannot be uh, a, a, an offense for which one goes to jail. In fact, I think it should not be a crime. Now, then th the future in which people make decisions about should there be regulation, should there be a state monopoly, should there be sales in drug stores, what are we going to do, how are we going to quality control, I'll let my children take care of that because it's going to be a big problem. But right now, decriminalization. I want no one ever again to go to jail for the possession of marijuana, ever. People in 72 were sitting back smoking a joint, say, I'll be smoking a joint legally next year. And the same people, just the stepping stone, right? One's down, next one comes up, right? And sooner or later, like I said, uh, things are going to have to change, right? People are going to can only run from the truth for so long. So it's inevitable that things are going to go how we wanted them to go this time. It's obviously it's going to take a little bit more. I think the, the first step in, in, in sort of acquiring hope is, is going to be education. One thing that Chris's trial has done is I think at least it's got the thing out in the open and people are starting to talk about it. And I must say when Chris came home from Ryerson with all his research you've heard about, and he was trying to explain to me the truth about hemp and cannabis and marijuana, I was not interested. I could care less. I remember how quick I was to condemn, you know, and judge. And I think it's almost like I didn't deserve an opinion until I found out more about the issue. I started going through some of this research and I got hooked. It was really fascinating. It was very, very interesting and I learned a lot that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And then he taught me a lot. Uh, Essentially what I said was that this is a matter for Parliament, not a matter for the courts. Do you think Parliament will ever deal with this? I think eventually they probably will. Uh, you know, they're the same as uh, the Parliament of South Australia, or the Capital Territory. They, I think that those places they acted because they, they became fully informed as, as to all the ramifications. Do you think it's just a lack of information? Oh, I think it's a lack, uh, to a large extent it is. Uh, the, the, the results of my trial, I, I learned things that I'd never ever heard before. From the reading of my judgment, you can see that my uh, attitude uh, is not certainly not one of total condemnation for anybody that uh, 
is in possession of a uh, small amount of marijuana, but it, it, it can be harmful to young people. Um, the controls that need to be in place are controls, in my view, that can only be imposed by the government, by parliament, not by, not by uh, courts. The threat of legal penalties is not an effective deterrent. Prohibition doesn't work. Does the public know that? No. Do the police ever bother to tell them that? No. Uh, let's take the, ulti the example of ultimate surveillance in our society, our prisons. There's not a prison in Canada where drugs are not readily available. If you can't stop drugs from entering and being used in a prison where people are under guard 24 hours a day, how in hell do you expect to be able to stop it in a country that's got thousands and thousands and thousands upon thousands of kilometers of, of, of uh, coastline and borders and ports of entry? You can't. Unless you create such an abominable surveillance society that it would make George Orwell's 1984 look like a, a parlor game. There was support for Lynn Herritchie today as she made her way to London Police Headquarters. The 36-year-old mother of two suffers from multiple sclerosis and says marijuana is the only drug that eases her pain. She's now hoping to make the lawmakers understand. To do that, she attempted to light a marijuana cigarette on the steps of the police station and was immediately arrested. If they honestly believe that this is a crime, I hope they give me the maximum sentence, whatever it is. Because otherwise, they're just saying that they're not right if they just give me a light sentence. I will reoffend. You can't rehabilitate me. I know that marijuana helps me, and I'm not going to give up that just because it's against the law. But there will always be a debate. There will be those who say, you know, it's harmless, decriminalize it, and stop wasting these resources. And I guess that's, at least for the moment, part of the political landscape. Basically, the judge took all the evidence we presented through the nine expert witnesses and came to the conclusion, much ado about nothing. This is about as dangerous as having a couple coffees a day. Chris was basically doing this as an act of political activism. So the deal was to wrap up all the charges into one sweet deal where he would plead guilty to everything globally and just be put on probation. The bottom line was we didn't want Chris to go to jail. Chris didn't want to go to jail. He didn't see any value in martyring himself for the cause. And once we could orchestrate this deal, his parents were very relieved and I'm doing my job. I've often asked the question, is there a difference uh, becoming, between um, coming home at the end of the day and smoking a joint, and coming home at the end of the day and uh, having a glass of wine? Did you smoke? Marijuana? Yeah. Occasionally, yes. Not as much as I used to. I don't answer personal questions. I never, I, it's just a false, I won't answer any personal questions. No, I haven't, and it was a, when I came to the police service, it was a requirement to, uh, to claim in writing that you had not used drugs or, or, or um, messed with any substances in any way. So I haven't um, had to, uh, as a person, I haven't had to deal with that particular temptation. I, n I never have. Matter of fact, I had to ask them what the difference was between cannabis and hashish today. <laughs> I did smoke marijuana in Puerto Rico, but uh, it didn't encourage me to continue because I didn't know how to inhale. And by the time they had taught me how to inhale, 
it hurt, and I had consumed some five or six cigarettes, so I didn't feel very good. I felt silly. No, I haven't. To my knowledge, I didn't know what uh, marijuana looked like <laughs> until I saw a hemp plant grow. That was the one we planted, so. But I like the smell of it. <laughs> I don't care for it very much. It doesn't, I, I kept trying it because it made my friends so happy, so why shouldn't it? But it was never very important to me. So I'm in this for the politics and the money, not for the drugs. No, never ever happened. I wasn't in that generation. It was a generation or two after I came along. And see, by the time the 60s came, I was approaching 50 years old. And uh, I don't recall ever seeing marijuana at, at university. It just didn't exist. And, growing up in Canada. And politicians also have admitted to, to smoking as well. They don't inhale. Did you inhale? Well, I know from my experience as uh, Attorney General of Canada that we still have the right against self-incrimination in this country, and I think it's a very important part of our charter. Whose business is it anyway? Yeah.